In the vibrant city of Toronto, known for its cultural diversity and emerging hip-hop scene, one man's journey took an unexpected turn, leading him from the six to the bright lights of Los Angeles, then ending in a harrowing experience in Ohio. Join me as we explore the life and trials of a Toronto rapper who went on the run for a crime he supposedly didn't commit. Sunny morning and 20-year-old Nathan Lee is heading out for a bike ride, but steps from his home, Lee is gunned down at point-blank range. Toronto police have identified one of the suspects as 21-year-old Shamari White. He is, he is known to the police. CBC News has learned he has a criminal record. They released today's video in hopes of finding White and identifying the second suspect. Yesterday... No, fuck it, come man. No, I of Jane shit, man. Fuck the ops, man. No, the fuck it, come man. These niggas clicking up like bitches, man. Uh, and my blue tea on your block, and I'll fuck with cover, man. Uh. I'm on your block in my blue tea, yeah. big lock in my blue tea. Yeah. If I see a I'll be getting shot in my blue tea. Yeah. Shamori White, better known by his stage name YG, is originally from Rexdale, from a block known as The Towns. He didn't spend much time there as his mother was often busy from work and would leave him with his aunt who lived 15 minutes away on the north side of Jane and Finch, on a corner known as Shoreham Court. Right across from Shoreham is Driftwood, a block known to have cultivated some of the city's most talented artists. From the likes of Pressa to Toronto rap pioneer Robin Banks, Driftwood has been dominating Toronto's underground rap scene for a near decade, but before these talents emerged, the block was known for something far more sinister. Toronto police conducted a number of early morning raids targeting a street gang known as the Driftwood Crips. The Driftwood Crip Street Gang, a gang police allege is a criminal investigation with cells across the country and who have no regard for public safety. Members of this group have been involved in numerous reckless acts including shootings, kidnappings, firearm offenses, armed sexual assaults, robberies, drug trafficking and other serious criminal offenses. June 13th, 2007. Project Cryptic was underway. The takedown followed an 11-month investigation by Toronto police and other forces, including Barrie, Niagara, York Region, and the RCMP. It involved more than 700 officers carrying out 130 search warrants, 37 of them in the Jane and Finch area. Along with the 95 arrests, police seized more than $1 million in various drugs, nearly three dozen firearms, $221,000 in Canadian currency, and $5,500 in U.S. currency. At the epicenter of the project were the Driftwood Crips. Originating out of Driftwood Court, the crew first caught the eye of investigators a year prior to the raids, after a man was fatally shot and three others were wounded as cars raced down a residential street in Rexdale. Although the survivors refused to give information to police, investigators were able to tie the incident to the Driftwood Crips, who were the main rival of several gangs across Rexdale. Then on May 23rd, 15-year-old Driftwood Court resident Jordan Manners was fatally shot in a stairwell at his high school. Two weeks later, a shootout would unfold right outside of his family home. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. This pushed the Jane and Finch neighborhood over the edge and demanded city leaders to crack down on the gun violence that was clearly infecting their neighborhood. The resistance resulted in the creation of a two-member provincial commission to investigate what can be done to address youth violence in the struggling corridor. Some longtime residents still weren't convinced action was being taken, with one quoted saying, it's the same thing every summer. Police stormed the area, and then a couple of weeks later, they release all of them back in the same place. This wasn't the issue with the Driftwood Crips though, it was actually far worse. According to court documents, even after the arrests of the quote-unquote three generals, the crew continued to thrive because of two factors. One, several high-ranking members were able to conduct operations while incarcerated. And two, while a heap of youngsters were recruited sometime after the raids, some were already next in line to take head of operations. The Driftwood Crips have a clear hierarchy with some of its leaders even operating and directing from within correctional facilities. This point speaks uh, directly to the influence and power of the group's leadership. 
A detective from the Toronto police told journalists, the people that are in the Driftwood Crips were born and raised in that area. So, you're looking at their brothers, their sisters, their sons, their daughters. It sort of creates this code of silence. After the mass takedown, it wouldn't take long for the crew to start making noise again, but this time, they were under a new label, the Young Buck Killers. Court documents listed several members. Notable names include rappers Wasi, Pressa, GD, FB, and the man himself, YG, who was just 17 at the time. All five men were essentially the new foot soldiers for the crew. They were directly involved in the trafficking of firearms and drugs, primarily cocaine. The new generals to take head of operations were Mohammed Hersey, FB's older brother Gould Mahadale, aka Gully, and Press's older brother Shermar Gardner, aka Bundog. Not long after the mass arrests of the Driftwood OGs, these guys took lead and within three years, they were a thriving criminal organization. They had managed to expand their operations as far north as Sudbury as well as across Western Canada. They had even become the main Fendi supplier for a high-ranking Hells Angels member. Operations grew at such a rapid pace that it only took three years after Project Cryptic for Toronto police to catch wind of YBK and organized their second project targeting the crew. By September 2011, wiretaps would be placed on several young buck killers, including YG. What investigators would hear over the course of their mere three-month investigation would add up to nearly 300 pages worth of evidence, ranging from conversations about shootings to trafficking firearms. On October 1st, 2011, YG robbed a man who went by the moniker, Brains. Among the things he robbed was a chain. In a wiretap call the next day, Bundog talked at length about YG's robbery of Brains, calling it a quote-unquote, young buck thing. Later that same day, YG was arrested at 390 Driftwood Avenue in connection to an alleged domestic dispute. He identified himself as Shane Campbell and said he resided there. Apparently, that was enough to fool the cop as he was released and all of the property found on him at the time of his arrest, including the chain he robbed from Brains, was returned to him, except a Blackberry Bold. The phone wasn't returned because YG said it didn't belong to him and he didn't know where he got it from. Upon further investigation, the phone was found to be registered to a man by the name of Quincy Taylor. After the completion of Project Marvel, it would be revealed Quincy Taylor was the alias Bundog would use when conducting his drug operation. Two days later, YG would call Bundog and tell him an elaborate tale about losing his trap phone. He said he was in a taxi with a gun along with several other people when they were suddenly stopped by police. YG said he jumped out of the taxi and ran, and while the police chased him, the others got away with the gun. When YG mentioned the feds probably have his trap phone as well, Bundog wasn't happy, knowing there were pictures and videos of his illicit activity on the phone. Two weeks after that conversation, at approximately 9 p.m., shots were fired inside Wilson Subway Station in Toronto. A video from the station shows a man being chased down a flight of stairs by YG and another YBK member. That evening, phone calls were intercepted, and investigators could hear YG discussing what had occurred at Wilson Station with his affiliates, with one person saying that the incident occurred because some youths were moving slimy. One month later, wiretaps on Bundog's phone were intercepted and he could be heard giving YG instructions on where to obtain a firearm somewhere in Hamilton. Eleven days after that conversation, YBK member GD was shot in the foot in Hamilton. Moments later, Bundog was called by one of his associates who had seen what happened. Bundog told them to call 911, which they did. A few minutes later, before the police arrived at the scene, the associate called Bundog back and asked him what they should do with the gun they had. Bundog instructed them to give the gun to another associate who was also there, Prince Asante, and have him leave. Bundog then met up with YG and they joined up with Asante in a black charger, but they were stopped by police a few minutes later. Asante was arrested, but Bundog and YG ran and escaped custody. The police subsequently found a loaded .45 caliber automatic handgun on the floor of the charger. Based off wiretap conversations later that night between Bundog, YG, and several other young buck killers, it was clear they knew who shot GD, and there was talk of retaliation. 
However, Toronto police believed they had a sufficient amount of evidence to establish YG and his fellow YBK associates had access to multiple guns which were used not only for protection while carrying out their drug programs but also for retaliation if required. So, two days later, at approximately 5 o'clock in the morning, nearly 900 law enforcement officers from various departments began executing 67 search warrants simultaneously across Toronto, Hamilton. Ottawa and Surrey, British Columbia. Handguns, automatic rifles, and more than a hundred thousand dollars in cash. Items seized during yesterday's cross-country crackdown. We're uh, confident we've made a dent in some of the organized crime that's been plaguing some of these communities. But Kemi Olenloyo isn't so sure. We have seen these things developing. The, young the community activist there. says she knows many of those arrested, some as young as 14 facing charges that include attempted murder. They appeared in court today, one by one, and many have already been released. If your children have guns, moms, look in their rooms, check. You might have a killer on the dinner table. The mass takedown would be dubbed Project Marvel, and according to court documents, the first arrest was none other than YG. On December 13, 2011, at 5.07 a.m., YG's residence was raided. He, along with another YBK member, were placed in the living room. It was there when officers found a fully loaded 40 caliber Taurus handgun with the serial number scratched off in a flower pot and two phones. Within these phones contained three videos titled Hard Oz 1, Hard Oz 2, and Hard Oz 3. They begin with a close up of a pot on the front burner. In the pot, in what appears to be boiling water, is a Pyrex measuring cup containing a white substance. As the camera pulls back, Two individuals are standing before the stove. Investigators were able to identify Bundog as the person who is stirring the white substance and YG as the person recording. YG was subsequently arrested and charged with a list of offenses ranging from drug trafficking to firearms possession. With the substantial evidence collected during the three-month investigation, it would take more than four years to reach the sentencing stage. The first ones up to hear their fate were the three generals of YBK. Mohammed Hersey, who Justice Stephen Clark called one of the gang's principal leaders, was sentenced to 13 years in prison. Gully was handed an eight-year sentence and was deported to Somalia. Bundog was sentenced to 10 years and was released in 2020. For his part in Project Marvel, YG served two years and was released by January of 2014. He was arrested again in November of 2015 and found guilty of breaking and entering. He was sentenced to one month in jail, two years of probation, and handed a lifetime weapons ban. After YG was released in January of 2016, he laid low for a bit. Around this time, several of his Driftwood affiliates were rising in Toronto's underground rap scene, so he would often accompany them to their studio sessions. Naturally, he began rapping with them. He would appear on his first track, Chicken Coop, on May 9, 2016, which didn't see much success, but 24 hours later, he would drop a track some would regard as a certified hit classic. I told her that I love her just to fuck her. If she try and set me up, I have to dust her. Yeah, yeah. I give her bricks and then I turn her to a runner. I know she from my eye block, then I don't trust her. Nearly seven years after its release, her by YG still holds replay value amongst Toronto rap fans. In the music video, YG can be seen donning a free press machine shirt. This is because Pressa at the time, who often went by the moniker Press Machine, was incarcerated. Coincidentally, just two weeks after the release of what was supposed to be his breakout song, YG's path to success would take an unexpected turn, as he would find himself in a situation similar to his close friend. Sunny morning and 20-year-old Nathan Lee is heading out for a bike ride, but steps from his home, Lee is gunned down at point-blank range. The video released by police today shows the two suspects approach. Both are armed with handguns. 20-year-old Nathan Lee always loved to be outdoors riding his bike in the fresh air of his Jamestown neighborhood, where he lived for nearly 12 years. But on a clear, bright morning doing just that, Nathan was brazenly shot when two men made an attempt on his life just steps away from his home. He survived, but was left paralyzed from the incident. At the time, the shooting was just the latest in a string of gun violence targeting Jamestown residents. It happened not far from where Candace Rochelle Bob, a 35-year-old woman who was five months pregnant, was killed a month prior by bullets that hit her in the back seat of a car. Her baby was removed through emergency C-section, but passed a month later. 
According to Toronto Police, they linked both incidents to a decade-long gang feud between the Young Buck Killers and Rexdale's Jamestown Crips. They went on saying that Pressa, who was incarcerated at the time for the kidnapping case, was jumped and beaten in jail by other rival gang members. The attack occurred one week before the Nathan Lee incident, which left investigators to believe the ambush on Nathan was an act of revenge by the Young Buck Killers. After police released footage of Nathan's ambush, his mother Tracy was able to identify one one of the men seen in the video. In fact, the man once lived two doors down from her. It was YG. Two days after being identified, YG's face was plastered all over the city and a Canada-wide warrant was sent out for his arrest. Fearing for his safety and facing serious legal charges, he made the difficult decision to leave behind his hometown and embark on a journey to escape the long arm of the law. YG arrived in Los Angeles, a city known for its glitz and glamour. In the City of Angels, he continued to create music, reflecting on the life he left behind in Toronto and the dreams he still pursued. In his own words, he was just living the life. If these guys are fucking really gonna fucking try to fuck over my life, I'm gonna try to have some much entertainment as I can, right? Yeah. So when I was in America, I just was doing the most. I was going to LA, fucking, Mel was in Fairfax, fucking, mm. I was going to a wow. hell of fucking parties, house parties, I was going to shows, fucking. I was headed, I was seeing every rapper, every rapper there is, I made a song with Jay Kirsch, and when I was over there, I was making money too, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like anywhere I go at the end of the day, I just like the way how I was raised and the way where I'm from, like, since I was 14, I've been making money. Since I was a little kid, I've been making money. You could put me anywhere in the world, I could be, pick me up and drop me in China. I'm going to make money if you drop yeah. me in China, you know? Mm -hmm. While on the run, YG would feature on tracks with J. Critch and Driftwood affiliate 21 Neat, but under the moniker 35 Neat, possibly in hopes of throwing off the feds. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough, as YG's run from the law would last no more than two years. He was caught all the way in Columbus, Ohio, and formally charged with attempted murder. He was extradited back to Toronto, where he was welcomed with a media frenzy, which seemed to have caught him off guard. Tell me about that experience, that that moment that popped up on my on i on ig where like you're coming through the oh, airport with the f handcuffed with the people what was going through your mind then? no that i didn't even i didn't see that right i just hearing about it but at the end of the day i wasn't there i was in jail when that when they're posting that shit right okay but when i like when i when they brought me to the airport and i'm seeing this shit like i came to the airport i'm cuffed up mm -hmm. and i just seen like like two white guys First, I seen like bare people, and I seen like white guys with cameras. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't really paying them no mind. I didn't think it was that serious until I seen him just up the camera and he's depressing the button. But the button doesn't sound like a regular camera; it sounds like a machine gun. Like, welcome home. Hey, hey, hey. Just walk. Just walk. Just walk. Just walk. Oh, wow. Saying what the fuck's going on? You know what I'm saying? So and then I start telling the police to put on my hood and shit, and mm. just playing games, you know, trying to put on my hood. As luck would have it, when YG was captured, Pressa would be cleared of all charges in his kidnapping case. He would then spend 50k and provide YG with the same lawyer who helped clear his name. It looks like that 50k was well spent as YG would spend no more than 7 months in pretrial custody before he was cleared of all charges. That's right, even with the CCTV footage, and after going on the run for two years, he was still cleared of all charges. Also, the victim refusing to testify probably helped his case as well. Nevertheless, after being released, he wasted no time hopping back into the studio to share his side of the story. I jump like candles, nigga you snitch, it's touching like rhino, they trying to frame me, it was a scandal. Uh. In collaboration with Pressa and Juno Award-winning producer Wonder Girl, YG's Gamble hit a quarter of a million views in just under two weeks after its release. Judging by the comments, it was clear fans were shocked by his abrupt return to the scene, but YG wasn't phased by the noise. If anything, he was fueled by it. In the trap, watch your auntie. Hey, auntie. She up a brick in her panty. Stop. It's YG and Houdini. Cody, I think Alongside get... Houdini, YG would earn his first certified gold record just two months after the release of Gamble. Dubbed Toronto's national anthem by supporters, it appears Anti would be the spark YG needed as he began releasing hits at breakneck speed soon after. With songs like Was, Mr. Walkthrough, and Meat Machine 2, he amassed a large enough catalog for him to begin performing at sold-out venues by the end of the year. He quickly gained a reputation for his captivating energy and raw storytelling as his bars captured the essence of Toronto's underworld. 
not even a year after going on the run and beating an attempted murder charge, YG was already competing against some of the biggest names in the scene. He finished 2019 strong with four projects and heading into 2020, he continued to set his mark on the scene. I think we all can agree 2020 was a memorable year for everyone, to say the least, but for Toronto rap fans, it was the year of the diss tracks. First, it started with Lil Barrett. After videos were leaked of the Regent Park rapper in compromising positions, YG didn't hesitate to be the first person to share his thoughts on the situation. Yo. Let me take a bumba clap for in this. Yo, yo. Party boy. The need for the far from we. Cause they're not in our wiener. No cap. I seen Barrett in Montreal. Ask him if he said a word to me. Ask him if he opened up his mouth and even said something to me. His homies are around me and guess what they're trying to ask me? Why did you come to my neighborhood? Why are you making, why are you making stories in my neighborhood? Why are you going to my neighborhood and making stories in my hood? Cause what do you mean why am I making stories in your hood? Your hood is fucking legal. Anybody could come out there and stand up and make a story over there. The fuck? You guys are not out there. You guys are babies. These guys came to me, 35, Big Boss 35, to ask him why he was in their neighborhood. Ask them what they were talking to me about. Why were you in my neighborhood? YG's terrorization of Regent Park rappers continued a month later when he released a diss track targeting the late Smoke Dog. Alongside Top 5, YG would earn his first number one trending YouTube video with the diss. This also marked the first time an underground Toronto rapper earned a number one trending YouTube video. YG's reign of terror on Regent Park ended there as his focus quickly shifted to Malvern-based rapper Honcho Hoodlum. Two months after releasing Heard of Me, YG would drop Blue T. In the music video, he can be seen wearing a familiar blue shirt while roaming the streets of Malvern. This, coupled with the bars. It's easy to see why the track left many fans stunned. The dissing continued throughout the end of 2020, but heading into the new year, it appears his antics may have caught up to him, because YG was arrested all the way in Yukon Territory. On January 21st, following an investigation, the RCMP initiated the arrest of two men in the Whitehorse neighborhood of Porter Creek at approximately 10.50 p.m. 33-year-old Harnick Binder, from B.C., was advised that he was under arrest and attempted to run from police, but was successfully apprehended. During this ordeal, the passenger of the vehicle exited and ran from police. The passenger, YG, was captured and arrested after officers released a canine unit. He was charged with resisting arrest, escape from lawful custody, and possession of property obtained by crime under $5,000. Both men were released on conditions shortly after. Since being released, YG has managed to stay out of trouble and has continued to put out projects on a consistent basis. He proves that even in the darkest of times, the power of music and the pursuit of justice can lead to redemption and success.